<laughs> well, today's uh, guest at the Namaste Center on Mother's Day 2012 is one of our favorite presenters here and certainly the most popular. Her name is Jonna Ray Bartis and her slogan is, I see dead people so you don't have to. <laughs> she grew up psychic, frequently seeing spirit visitors in her family's circa 1750 Pennsylvania farmhouse. All through school and in her first job as a newspaper reporter and editor, she tried to appear normal while being bombarded with psychic information. Finally, when she turned 24, she realized she had to find out once and for all if she was psychic or psychotic. She quit her newspaper job to go on what turned out to be a two-year spiritual quest. Jonna Ray used her natural psychic abilities to navigate a near-death experience 23 years ago, win Emmy Awards as a TV producer, and talk to Walt Disney and Wales while doing PR for Disneyland and SeaWorld. She is an author, speaker, Reiki master teacher, Diksha blessing giver, and minister director with the Universal Brotherhood, Brotherhood Movement. She is here this morning to connect you with your mothers and others in the spirit world, and this afternoon teach you how to make this connection yourself. So we'd love to welcome you today, John Array, to the Namaste Center. Well, it's always wonderful to have you here today. Well, I'm so excited. You've created such a sacred space, and, and you people are so lucky that you have a resource like this. It's like an incubator or a sanctuary. <laughs> Well, we are blessed, and we're blessed to have people like you come in, and, uh, you know, I have to say, you, uh, what was normal, uh, I saw a Facebook posting that said, I tried being normal once, it was the worst five minutes of my life. <laughs> so, and I think we can all relate to that, based on the giggles. So, we're just going to go right into it, Jonna. What is the other side that we hear about? Okay, well, I, I kind of want to do a little disclaimer, because... Uh, something that I feel very strongly about is the most important thing that we have is our direct connection to whatever your idea of God is. You know, um, creator, true source of all love, God, I mean, however you want to define this. And what I'm going to be sharing with you all day today is from my personal experience. And what this means is every single book that you read, every lecture that you go to, is somebody else's opinion. And sometimes they're going to resonate for you and you're going to think, huh, there's a lot of truth in that. I, I want to, I think I can take some stuff from that. But other times you're going to have a personal experience yourself that's going to be very much in conflict with what you've heard in a book. And so I guess what I'm saying is every single one of us is divine. Every single one of us has a piece of the puzzle and never, never, never discount what you bring to the party. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what is the other side? Okay. <laughs> so to me, having visited there, um, the other side is, uh, it's not going to a different place. You know, there, there was recently a Time Magazine cover story even on uh, Rethinking Heaven. Did any of you guys see that? Okay. But um, when we die, we don't really go anywhere different. We're right here. Because when I died, I'd had a dream two nights before I died that I was going to have a choice to live or die and to not be frightened. Because I was in a very bad marriage. I wasn't doing any of my spiritual work. I was quite miserable. And it's almost like I was given this little window of opportunity to, you know, cash in and move out. <laughs> and uh, so uh, two mornings later, when I got awake with a splitting headache and I was having trouble breathing and I couldn't move my legs, I wasn't the least bit frightened because I realized, oh, this is what that dream was about. <laughs> so I was able to call the secretary at work and um, have her uh, tell my now ex-husband what was going on and also call the paramedics and tell them where we had the key to the house so they didn't have to axe in the door. And I stayed in my body until I heard them coming in the door. And uh, as soon as they came in the house, then I left. And what I did was I just kind of floated out of my body. And I know you've read a lot of things about this. Um, Edgar Casey talks about this. Um, it, it's really beautiful. It, it's like the people that you love, whenever they die, they're, they're still with you. And this goes for pets, too. It's not like there's a, a separate destination where they go. And the other side, my experience with it was everything was a lot brighter. It was a lot more fluid. There was this, this overwhelming sense of connection. It's almost like such a, a heart-centered 
experience there. Because one of the, the challenges that I think we have here is understanding the idea of if you're a quantum physicist, the unified field, or if you're one of us, you know, God consciousness or Christ consciousness. And to get into that space, you need to get out of your analytical head where we live most of our lives, you know, editing, uh, analyzing, judging, all that. Get out of that space into the heart space. And on the other side, that's what happens. It's like your heart just expands. And you feel this connection, this beautiful connection to everyone and to everything. And it is absolutely fantastic. There was a, a conversation on uh, Ted, a, a woman who, whose brother was schizophrenic, and so she devoted her life to studying the brain. She became, um, I don't know, like a neurophysicist, or I, I don't know exactly what you would call what she did, but she herself had a stroke. Did any of you see yes, this? Yes, yes, okay. Yes, yes. And the way she was describing this, too, even though she didn't actually like cease to exist on this side, the idea of like going out through that expansiveness, that, that clarity, that, that sense of connection and, and just incredible love beyond judgment, beyond guilt, beyond all the things, the baggage that we carry with us, um, that's what the other side is like. And the other cool thing about that was any place that you could imagine you would suddenly be. Because right now we have the limitation that, well, we have to go from point A to point B in a straight line. Well, on the other side, um, you can be like in the hospital room where I was, you know, watching them, or even in the ambulance, watching them working on me and floating out. And then I would suddenly think about my parents in Pennsylvania, and I'd be in Pennsylvania. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so they're... <clears throat> Technically, we don't even have those limitations here, but we tend to kind of think they are when we're staying in our head. And on the other side, you don't have that, that limited frame of reference. It's like you begin to understand, oh, anything's possible. Okay, <laughs> I can fly. <laughs> well, so what so, about uh, the people who believe in hell? What mm -hmm. would you say to them? I'd say they're going to go there. Because... <laughs> 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 In a, in a nutshell, something that, something that Richard Bach says in the book Illusions. How many of you guys have read that book? Yeah, that's, I think that's another you know, mandatory textbook for us while we're here. But um, one of the wonderful quotes from the, the handbook for the Messiah is, is, argue for your limitations, and sure enough, they're yours. Because my own experience was the other side was glorious. It was bright. It was beautiful. There was such clarity and such love and connection. But I read a story about a Baptist minister who had uh, a near-death experience. He went to hell. And he had the flames and the demons and, and all the other, you know, horrible things that he warned everybody about every Sunday. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he, he had created that idea. You know, that's... He, he held on to that. That was his limitation. That was his idea of, of what goes on. And, um, you know, because all of us, you know, yin-yang, white wolf, black wolf, you know, good and bad in all of us. Everybody has a shadow side. And apparently he was, you know, consumed with guilt about some of the human things that he did here. And so he went to hell. And I think he was very glad to come back. And hopefully he took the opportunity to kind of rethink <laughs> uh, where he was going to go. Because we pretty much create what the reality is going to be. Something that um, just horrified me when I was a child. I grew up in Pennsylvania, and my parents uh, took um, my two brothers and me to Gettysburg. And there are a lot of young people on the battlefield at Gettysburg who don't realize that they were killed, that their physical body was, was killed. And I just remember hearing this buzzing and being so upset. And, of course, no one else in the family knew what I was talking about. And they would do the Twilight Zone music and, <laughs> you know, so... But um, depending on what your consciousness is, you know, if, if you're not open to the idea that you can free yourself from a physical form and move into another reality, you might kind of be stuck there. But we can help those people, you know, through prayer, through our intention to, like, guide them to the light, all of that stuff. But that's another idea of what hell is all about. Wow. Well, so watch your thoughts. Uh, <laughs> I think this would be a better one to choose uh, myself. Mm -hmm. So uh, your uh, tagline, which I love, is you see dead people so we don't have to. Mm -hmm. But are we all able to tap into that gift? Absolutely. Everybody is psychic. Everybody is a healer. Everybody has the opportunity to see through the veils and go into other dimensions. It all depends on, again, arguing for our limitations. Um, I, I was 
sometimes when I get off on my, you know, well, if I was in charge of the world right now, <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the way the Dalai Lama is raised, you know, when, when the old Dalai Lama dies, um, you know, their, their head kahuna guy has visions about where the new Dalai Lama was born, mm -hmm. and the people from the temple go and, and get this child and bring this child back to the temple. <clears throat> and from day one, this child is told, you are sacred, <clears throat> you are divine, you are a high spiritual leader, mm -hmm. all wisdom is available to you. you, we're just going to help you remember this. You're a healer, you're compassionate, you are a leader of the world. And I'm getting chills. And this is the message that he gets every single day of his life, every single moment of every single day. And guess what? He grows up to be this compassionate spiritual leader who works to bring all the people of the world together. So if, if in our schools we were giving kids messages like that, you know, you have no limitations. You know, you be of service. You know, do things that, that resonate with your heart, that bring people together. You, are, you have access to all knowledge. How different would that be for our kids? How different would that have been for us had we been raised in that kind of an environment? And then there was another wonderful story about that where this teacher was told, okay, you're going to have this class of fifth graders and they're gifted children. She thought, great. And so she went in. Have you guys heard this story? Yes. She, okay, I love this story. And she went in and they had just a magnificent year, you know, very creative. The kids were all in, in, involved and they just loved learning and got fantastic grades and everything was spectacular. And uh, at the end of the semester, she was told, you know, those were actually like, uh, you know, remedial, like C-type students, and we just told you they were gifted. But the kids all rose to that expectation, mm. you know, because she basically said, you have no limits, you know. You are gifted, you are special, and you are very, very smart. And guess what? <laughs> These remedial C cast-off students suddenly rose to the challenge. Wow. So That's, well... It's a good reminder for sure. Well, so uh, what would you say that the people from the other side want to tell us exactly what the Dalai Lama is being told? Or Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. A huge thing, a huge thing that they want to do is reassure us because the part of the baggage that we carry with us, you know, when we're stuck in our heads, our guilt, you know, oh gosh, I wish I could have done more for them. Um, unresolved issues, you know, gosh, I wish we could have talked about this before they died. Um, I, I think, you know, my, my mother really never understood me and didn't really love me, or um, I, I just never, never did enough for her while she was here. You know, I, I put her in a nursing home, and, and that must have been horrible. And all these guilt things, all this baggage that we've carried with us for decades, decades usually, and the big thing they want us to know is none of that matters, to just kind of let that go, because it's all about moving back into a heart space. So it's, it's reassuring us. It's like, yes, they love us. And, and there is no pain. They are whole. They are, are you know, vital. And uh, people appear to me at different ages. Like there was one friend's grandmother who appeared to me as this beautiful young woman in her 20s as a USO singer with rhinestones on her shoes and the whole thing and all these servicemen falling in love with her. And um, turns out that's exactly what she did. <laughs> but um, Celeste didn't even know about those times really because she was... Um, she just knew her as grandma, you know. So uh, on the other side, no limits at all about how they, how they manifest, you know, how, how they appear to us. And it's only love. Yeah, because they want us to know everything is okay. They're out of pain. They're whole. They're complete. And that's, that's the big thing. They want us to release the idea of guilt. Wow. And, and they want to help us with our grief, too. They want to give us... Um, proofs sometimes that, that they're okay. That's a, that's a huge thing. I was called by a doctor one time who said that um, he had a patient that he couldn't do anything for. Her teenage son had committed suicide a year and a half earlier, and she had other children, but she had just been sucked into this vortex of you know, grief and guilt and couldn't function anymore. And the family was kind of falling apart, and they had tried all kinds of antidepressants, they tried all kinds of traditional counseling, and nothing could reach this woman because she was in just such, such horrible grief. And so the doctor said, okay, you're my last resort. <laughs> you know, I've, I've played all my cards. I have nothing else in my toolbox. Maybe you can help her. And um, so what I did, and uh, this was from Kansas, and I was in California at the time. So what I did was I just set up my little computer, and I prayed, and I said, okay, God, please show me what this woman needs to know to heal, to come back into balance. And I just started, um, was, as I was praying, uh, suddenly I saw this good-looking young guy wearing a leather jacket with uh, dark hair and, and glasses, walking with a big, light-colored dog. He's walking kind of down the road. There wasn't really a lot around him. And then when he felt me looking at him, he turned and looked at me, and then he came over and started telling me all this information. 
And as far as when they show up, um, okay, I want you to just stop for a second and think of the last movie that you saw. Okay, everybody have a movie? Mm -hmm. Okay, you know how as we're talking, you can kind of see it playing out. Mm -hmm. right. You can remember, you know, dramatic scenes here, the music and all that stuff. That's what it's like when they come to me, mm -hmm. as far as like being able to see that clearly. So I saw this whole thing play out and he gave me very specific information about he was so sorry, he never meant to kill himself, he was just a little bit crazy over this girl and was trying to get her attention and never thought that it would actually result in his death. And um, that his letter jacket was uh, on the chair in his room and when his mother put his jacket on he could hug her and he was with her constantly and it was time for her to get on with her life. And um, so, and I was typing this and I was crying and, and then right before I hit send I just thought, okay, I don't want to push her over the edge, you know, should I send this? And I just got, yes. Okay, <laughs> boom. <laughs> so I sent it, and then I stared at the screen for a while. <laughs> thinking, oh, dear God, please don't let anything bad happen. <laughs> and um, so the next morning, I turned in the computer, and there was a, a reply from her. And again, it was like, oh, dear God, please. And so I opened it up, and she said, I haven't stopped crying since I got your message. And I'm thinking, good cry or bad cry? Good cry or bad cry? <laughs> so I kept reading it, and yeah, everything was exactly right. You know, the big dog was his collie that had been hit by a car, like, the year before and, and yes he had been crazy over this girl who just wasn't responding to him and, and his letter jacket was there. I mean all these things but it was real specific proofs that helped her, that gave her comfort, that helped her move beyond this grief that kept her stuck in that space and that was so important to him. It's kind of like he was in limbo almost right. waiting to get this message to her. And how many of you guys have seen the movie Ghost? with yeah, Whoopi Goldberg. Okay, another mandatory study thing, I think, for all of us. But that's pretty much a documentary because lots of times we, we go through kind of putting this limitation on ourselves that we can't see, we can't communicate with them. And when they sense somebody can, it, it's like they, they line up to, to get messages <laughs> wow. to their people who are here to help with you know, the grief, the understanding that they're okay, they're not angry, they, that we should feel no guilt, no sorrow. Um, just to kind of celebrate the fact that, you know, they're always there. Something that came to me as I was praying about what I was going to do today, because I didn't know, <laughs> and all my people in, in spirit were laughing at me for being all nervous, and they were kind of saying, it's not about you, it's about us. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. There you go. <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's but, cute. But something that came through was, love means never having to say you're leaving. And I really like that. Oh, and again, beautiful. they're saying, let them know that wasn't you. Okay. <laughs> yes. uh, yeah. Keep you on your toes, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, the last question before we go into these pink slips here is, how can we develop that, that gift? Just the fact that we're talking about this now, just the fact that you chose to be here this morning, and thank you all so much for coming here. This is setting it in motion. There are very gifted psychics among you. <laughs> and, and really, it's people who are out of the closet who have admitted, yes, we are psychic. <laughs> so everybody is, and it's coming out of that. But there was another great TED Talk where, uh, oh, gee, I forget if he was a quantum physicist or what he was, but he was saying, basically, consciousness is the size of a golf ball. <laughs> and then the more that we allow ourselves to experience, the bigger and bigger this golf ball gets, and the more the limits are removed. And so just the fact that we're talking about this, just the fact that we're um, opening ourselves up to the possibility that this can happen is going to make it happen for you. And another analogy that came to me, thank you, <laughs> was, you know how you're, you're in your car, you're driving, you're not thinking that much about it, and then suddenly you start thinking, huh, I wonder if I'd ever want to get an Audi. And then, like over the next couple of days and weeks, you're going to see like every other car on the yeah. road is going to be an Audi. And what happened? Did these suddenly mysteriously appear right in front of you? It's like, no, you expanded your consciousness to be thinking, Audi, Audi. And by golly, they were there. They've always been there. It was just now you were looking for them. And the same with this type of communication. They are right here, you know, around us. It's a very crowded room right now. <laughs> and, and it's like just saying, okay, I'm going to look for this. I'm going to look for some kind of a connection because, you know, they would love to connect with all of you. So, oh, and one other quick story. Um, I first came to North Carolina because, um, how many of you know about the Light Center in Black Mountain? Okay, well, when Jim Gore was building that in 1979, I met him at a Spiritual Frontiers Fellowship Conference. It was in, um, I think, Guilford, at Guilford College. And I did a reading for him. I was, you know, one of the, the readers that they had. And he really liked what I did and, and invited me to come be the resident psychic there. 
Well, I got there, and it turns out they were just in the process of building the dome. So I was there, like, talking windows and doing all kinds of things, <laughs> besides talking to dead people. And um, when I made the transition from being there, and that was a wonderful period of my life, I was there for not quite a year, but then I got the message, get back into the real world and teach the truth by living it. And um, so I was staying at a, a friend's house, uh, Brigitte Berthier, if anybody remembers her or Brigitte Erdmann, she went back to then. But um, she was from Germany, she was going to spend the summer back in Germany. And she wanted me to kind of house sit for her for those three months. And so um, I was in the, the finished um, family room in the basement uh, for a couple days before she left just to kind of get used to the house. Okay, but my first night there, just about asleep, and, and suddenly there's this woman floating in front of me. <laughs> and she has very angular features, her hair is pulled back, she's very, very harsh. And even though I grew up doing this, still, when you're not expecting this and you're in a strange house for the first time, I did what anyone would do. I pulled the covers up over my head, <laughs> <laughs> put myself in white light, <laughs> moved the covers back down, and she's still there and very impatient, like, what is wrong with you? you know, that kind of thing. And, and, then she <laughs> and then she gave me this information to give to Brigitte. And, and then she, you know, floated away, and I reached over and turned on the light, and like, <laughs> went there. And then the next morning, as soon as I heard Brigitte walking around upstairs, I went running up the stairs and, and said, okay, do you know this woman who has like a really thin face and kind of a pointy nose? And, and she said, oh, I think that's my aunt. And she went and got a picture. And I said, yeah, that's her. <laughs> and I said, she said that the furniture is coming for you. Uh, I mean, coming to you, not, <laughs> not, not coming to you. <laughs> and uh, she said, well, no, 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 her, she just died and her estate is going to be tied up for years, so I won't hear anything about that for years. And of course, in two days, she got a phone call from you know, Europe saying, you're getting your aunt's furniture. Oh, wow. And, and ideally, you know, all of you guys and Brigitte would have been open enough to have accepted the information yourself instead of having to go through someone like me. <laughs> was just trying to sleep for the night. <laughs> but, that's but that's great. another reason why it's, it's good to like, give yourself permission to be able to do this, to like, expand that golf ball and, um, and know that, yeah, you can connect. Whole new meaning for Zen golf. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Well, so are we ready for these? <laughs> I'm yes. very nervous, but again, they're saying it's not about you. <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you that filled out a question, um, I'm going to select a few of them. We'll just see where mm -hmm. time leads us, mm -hmm. and we'll start with this one. You want me to read it? Yeah, or? please. Okay. And uh, what I do, the way I work is I just kind of take a deep breath, because when we're talking, we're in beta. When we uh, relax a little bit, we're in alpha. When we take a deep breath and deeply relax, then we go up into theta. And that's where creativity, inspiration, intuitive ability, that's where that is. So if it looks like I'm sleeping, I'm really not. I'm just going up. <laughs> so, okay. okay. Well, this one says, do we need to respond to those here who pass laws to attack and hurt women and gays? <clears throat> Absolutely. And, and they're helping with that, too. Because... Um, the three things that we need to be happy in our life, and this is from Dr. Marty Seligman, who created a new branch of psychology. It's called Positive Psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. And through decades of research, the three things that we need to be happy are faith and something greater than us, friends and family, and living a meaningful life. And so when something like this calls out to us and we're thinking, that's not right for them to do that, then part of us being happy is you know, working towards that meaningful life thing. And even if it's just initiating conversations, you know, logical, grounded, intelligent conversations with people about, look, look who this is really hurting. This is really hurting all of us when we do something like this. So, yeah. And they, on the other side, will help us with this, too. Uh, and, and a big thing about free will is uh, spirit guides, uh, people in spirit, um, angels, archangels, they're there to help us, but they're not just going to, you know, fly in and, and fix things. We have to ask them. You know, the whole thing about calling all angels. We ask for their help before they can give it to us. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. So we have to, like, be there mindfully. Please help me understand this. Please tell me what to say. And it will come. Okay, thank you. Well, we'll do another. Let's see here. This one is... Mama, are you happy? And husband Fred, have you forgiven me? Mm -hmm. 
um, I got the most beautiful image of Mama, uh, and she was actually like wearing old-fashioned roller skates and at a, a roller rink and having a ball. And it's like she was like young again and just having fun. And and also the symbolism of that shows, you know, freedom of movement, all that being able to move wherever she wants to go. She's very very happy, you know, completely out of pain, and. Uh, and Fred is kind of laughing. He's there, weren't you listening? <laughs> but we wrote these questions before, um, before I talked. And really, the, the first thing they let go of is any kind of guilt, any kind of resentment. You know, that's all gone. It's all, it's all you know, blessed and sanctified and cleansed and released. So, perfect. Okay, let's see. Okay, I think it says to Jazzy, is my new home going to work out for me? P.S. Okay, the, the interesting thing with this work, and, and those of you who are out of the closet psychics know what I'm talking about, it's like when we get something, okay, is it literal or is it symbolic? You know, that's, that's the number one thing that we need to deal with. And what I'm getting about the house is there's something around the roof. So um, whoever asked this question, um, you know, if you bought the house, hopefully a building inspection would have shown anything that was going on around there, but there's something around <coughs> the eaves. Maybe it... Um, it could even just be like cleaning out the gutters, something like that. I mean, it's, I, I do feel it's, it's a wonderful new space, but there's something about, you know, the roof, the edge of the roof, the eaves, the gutter around there that, that needs attention. Okay. This one seems to be popping out here. For Erica, do you have any message for me today? And there's a heart. E.G. Okay, well, something that cropped up was an image of a squirrel. <laughs> Whoever asked this question, does that mean something literally to you? Okay, because the other thing about what a squirrel symbolizes is um, they kind of never let up. You know, it's like they're always, like, gathering stuff for the long winter. They're always collecting things, <laughs> you know, to, to have a, a well-stocked nest. So if a squirrel doesn't literally mean something to you, like if you don't have a pet squirrel or, you know, your loved one in spirit <laughs> didn't have a pet squirrel, then, then I would say um, be mindful, you know, like um, don't spend a lot of time just smelling the roses, you know, make sure that you're, um, you know, cutting them and drying them for, for later. You know, plan ahead, I think, is what we're getting. Be logical. Have fun, you know. Be outside, climb trees, <laughs> but, um, but plan ahead. Great. Then we'll do a couple more here. So we'll dig down the bottom here. Do you miss me as much as I miss you? From M B. Uh, uh, well, the sweet thing about that is they are right with us. And something that they absolutely love is to be part of the family celebrations. They um, frequently they will show up in party hats if if they have a birthday coming up soon, or if you have a birthday coming up soon. They they love celebration and connection like that because again it goes back to the heart energy you know the heart connection and the heart love and the, the, that's what really defines the brightness and the, the beauty on the other side so um, so as far as missing it's like not being able to give you a hug the way that they could here but they're very very much with you know that know that and include them you know talk to them and and like on, on Mother's Day or on their birthday have something with like little pink roses and, and just just honor them because they honor you Remember, love is never having to say you're leaving. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and this one says, Mother, what message do you have for me this day? The biggest thing, the biggest thing that this beautiful mother and all mothers on the other side really want us to know is they want us to be happy. 
Because again, when we're happy, that again opens up our heart center more. So we can experience them more in our lives and we can truly live our lives more. Because happy people become spiritual people. It just works that way. When you're genuinely, you know, authentically happy, that, that little golf ball, not that there's anything wrong with a golf ball, <laughs> but, but it, it becomes huge and all-encompassing. So be happy. That's the big message. Okay, and I'm going to, I'll let you pick the last one, Madeline. Okay, thank you. Does my son Micah have a message for me? I immediately saw Micah in a cave, but not like, you know, scary. It was like um, a place to, well, like, like an incubator, you know, a place to discover to go deep within. And, um, and Micah had a light and, and was shining it on all these symbols that I, that I don't recognize, like cuneiform, um, like all around the walls of the cave. So it, it's like, this is a time to go deep inside, you know, to be very contemplative and, and just look for the wisdom that um, you already have access to because there are messages for you in, in, in the silence. There are messages for you in that sense of peace and in that sense of connection. There are lots of messages for you and it's, it's beautiful what he's showing. It really is. But it's like removing yourself from the hustle and bustle of every day and finding that quiet space where you can go within and receive the messages. Well, I'm sorry for everyone. We can't get to all the messages, but thank you for all those beautiful messages, and thank you for being here today, Jana. My honor. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> and all your friends. Yes. yes. <laughs>